Uh, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Robert Basili, and I'm happy to kick off our uh, May Qu uh, QCGSS talk. Uh, that is Quantum Computing Group's seminar series talk, uh, which, as always, we hold every third week of each month. Uh, today, Thomas Iadacola will be speaking to us regarding uh, adaptive variational quantum eigensolvers for highly excited states. Uh, Thomas first earned his PhD from Boston University in 2017 uh, before becoming a theoretical postdoc for the Joint Quantum Institute and Condensed Matter Theory Center. Uh, in 2019, he gained the title of assistant professor here at ISU, uh, focusing on the dynamics of quantum many body systems, uh, topological states of matter, and the intersection of these topics with quantum computing. Um, uh, please, Tom, take it away. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Thank you for the introduction, Bo. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about a uh, work that we recently posted on the archive uh, that was done in collaboration with uh, uh, a group here in Ames, uh, you know, sort of joint between uh, Iowa State and Ames Lab. Um, the sort of primary uh, co-PI on the NSF project that funds this work is, is Peter Orth. Uh, and uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of help also from our colleagues at, at Ames Lab um, with whom we collaborate on various topics in, in quantum computing. Um, and uh, today I wanna sort of, uh, my, my goal is to sort of convince you that, uh, you know, sort of variational quantum algorithms are an interesting uh, you know, are an interesting uh, approach to quantum computing on near term devices. And that uh, at the same time that looking at uh, something called highly excited states, which I will define are an interesting kind of test bed uh, for these algorithms and potentially for other algorithms that are, that are not sort of variational in nature, just because the, you know, this, this is sort of a physics problem that I think is uh, maybe a little bit uh, underappreciated in the in the in the quantum computing community as a as a potential test bed for uh, for for uh, you know quantum computing uh, applications. Um, so uh, I, I I won't dwell uh, too much on uh, you know the the definition of of, of NISC devices, but I want to uh, sort of set the stage a little bit still, although I'm sure everyone's familiar uh, with this concept by now. Um, you know, so NISC is kind of a, uh, an acronym for, uh, th that, that describes, you know, present day uh, quantum devices that was coined by John Preskill. He has this really nice uh, review that's about sort of what can we do with these NISC devices. Um, and, you know, a NISC device is, it's, you know, NISC stands for noisy intermediate scale quantum. Okay, so a NISC device is a, uh, is a device that has, you know, say 50 to 100 qubits. Um, so that's what intermediate scale means. Like it's pretty big, um, although not as big as we would necessarily like to uh, implement, uh, you know, sort of large scale uh, algorithms that are, that are, you know, believed to be of, of use in, in future applications. Um, but they're also very noisy, right? As, as the name implies. So, uh, you know, for the moment, uh, these kinds of devices, you know, have a sufficiently low error rate that you can perform a hundred to optimistically maybe around a thousand gates uh, before errors uh, start to dominate the output. So, um, you know, the sort of natural question to ask in this setting is, uh, you know, is there any kind of um, potential for what people call practical quantum advantage with NISC devices? You know, do we have to wait until we have a fully error corrected device in order to do something useful with a quantum computer uh, that is intractable classically? Or, uh, you know, can we actually get something done in the near term with the devices that we have right now? Uh, and uh, a lot of people believe this to be true, um, although you know I wouldn't say that there's really a definitive answer right now. Um, but typically, the the sort of the you know venues that you see people discuss, uh, you know, in this context of practical quantum advantage on this devices, you know, usually falls into one of two categories, namely quantum simulation, that is using quantum devices to simulate quantum mechanical systems that are in, in sort of classically intractable regimes, ideally or uh, optimization problems, for example, you know, speeding up optimization using quantum effects. So for example, using superposition to explore uh, an optimization landscape uh, more efficiently. 
Um, and you know, one uh, class of algorithms that's relevant in this setting is uh, the class of variational quantum algorithms. So um, variational algorithms uh, sort of provide a, I guess, hybrid uh, quantum classical approach in the sense that you know the quantum device is kind of used in a feedback loop with some classical, or it's used as a subroutine, if you will, in some kind of classical um, classical optimization. So um, you know the idea is that you use classical hardware to optimize a cost function that I'm calling C of theta, um, and that cost function is you know something that we want to calculate on the quantum device. So this is something that we want to measure on a NISC device. And, and the idea is that you know, if, if for the problem of interest, the cost function is difficult to calculate classically, then this is some place that you know, using, using quantum algorithms could, or using a quantum hardware platform could actually provide a speed up. And um, you know, this cost function is a function of some parameters theta, which uh, you know, I'm saying go from one to uh, calligraphic n. So you have some set of variational parameters. And uh, you know, by measuring, by repeatedly measuring the cost function, for different values of the variational parameters, you can uh, essentially uh, you know, use the measured values of the cost function as input for a, a classical optimization. Um, and this sort of idea is depicted in this nice figure from this recent uh, review article. Um, you know, so as I said, you know, you're calculating basically this, this cost function on a quantum device and then performing optimization uh, to uh, to sort of uh, you know try to converge towards your solution, and you know this this state psi of theta that you're using to compute the cost function, which is you know parameterized in terms of these variables theta, is called an onsatz state, and it's you know this this is you know only really a useful approach if this this onsatz psi of theta can be implemented with a finite depth circuit. So that means you know a circuit that uses uh, sort of a number of gates that that uh, is that scales. Ideally, you know, maybe polynomially and system size, but something, you know, something, something where the circuit is not too long. Okay, ideally. Um, and you know, if if that is true, then you know, you can potentially get some speed up or some advantage by running a deep circuit, you know, or you know, by running a shallow circuit many times instead of running a deep circuit once. Okay, so like if you want to factor numbers using Shor's algorithm that involves a deep circuit, but you know, uh, if you're lucky with Shor's algorithm, you only have to run it once to get your answer. Um, but uh, you know, here what you're doing instead is you're running a shallow circuit many times, and that really lends itself to the sort of NISC era because NISC devices have limited coherence time. So they can execute short circuits, um, but not long circuits, at least reliably. Um, and you know, a very famous example that I'll be sort of focusing on today um, of variational quantum algorithms is this uh, so-called variational quantum eigensolver. Um, so this is a variational algorithm to find the ground state of some Hamiltonian H acting on, for example, n qubits. Um, so you know, in this case, the way that people typically write down the onsatz is uh, you, know, you take some state, psi zero, and then you apply to that state some product of unitaries that are written you know, in terms of Hermitian generators uh, O nu. Uh, and then you have these real parameters uh, theta nu that, are, that you know, describe uh, essentially uh, you know, the angle of rotation, if you like, uh, uh, you know, are, use it, are generated by this unitary, okay? And, you know, there's a lot of freedom in choosing your ansatz, but typically, um, you know, a common choice that people often use is they take psi zero to be some product state that you obtain either by some initial optimization of your cost function, or, you know, maybe you just want to sort of uh, prepare your whole system in like the all zero state, or, you know, do a Hadamard transform on that to get the all plus state or something like this. But you know some state that's easy to prepare, and you know often it's convenient to choose these operators O new to be tensor products of Pauli operators and optionally the identity. Um, and these kinds of operators are called Pauli strings. And one reason that they're nice is that I mean among, among others is that they allow you they're easy to exponentiate and they can be uh, used uh, uh, to calculate gradients using the parameter shift rule. So those are kind of some reasons that people like Pauli strings. Um, and then the cost function in the context of VQE is essentially just the energy expectation value uh, of the in the variational state. So you know you take your many-body Hamiltonian H, maybe it's a molecule, maybe it's a lattice gauge theory, and then you uh, take the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in this in this variational state. So that's your cost function, and then you know the output 
is basically some set of parameters, which is you know the, the minimum over uh, over all choices of parameters of this cost function, or you know uh, some potentially some local minimum of your cost function, depending on how well your optimization went. Um, and you know the idea is that you know evaluate you know taking your onset state and evaluating it at the optimal value of the circuit parameters uh, gives you an approximation to the ground state. And evaluating the cost function in that state gives you an approximation to the ground state energy. Um, and you know the VQE ha has really seen a lot of interest uh, in the last few years, um, and uh, you know it's had already widespread applications in many body physics. Um, you know one of the sort of obvious places uh, that people might want to be using this, and people are using this, is in condensed matter physics and quantum chemistry. So there are numerous. Um, numerous papers that have uh, used this algorithm successfully to you know tested it successfully on on small small quantum systems. Um, another area of interest is gauge theory and nuclear physics. So there's a lot of interest in in kind of uh, improving um, on pot potentially improving on on classical simulations of of these types of systems using using quantum hardware. There's even you know for example uh, potential applications to quantum cosmology. In, in, in sort of the context of like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which kind of uh, is basically solving for the, the ground state of some uh, Hamiltonian of the universe, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, there have already been some compelling uh, proof of concept demonstrations on real devices. Uh, so this uh, figure comes from a recent paper that found the ground state of uh, uh, beryllium uh, hydrogen two molecule using six qubits. Uh, and these uh, black points are, are, are the data points. So you can see that you can get a pretty good approximation to, for example, the ground state energy as a function of interatomic distance here using this VQE, even on real hardware. Um, now, uh, you know, this, you, you can ask, I mean, so, you, you know, the, the goal of this algorithm is to, is to uh, obtain the ground state of some, some quantum antibody system. And you can ask like, okay, well, if I'm interested in practical, practical quantum advantage, how hard is it? actually do that classically, right? So how hard is it to, to, find, um, to find the ground state of a quantum anybody system? And you know, in general, quantum anybody states are hard to simulate classically because of entanglement, okay? So one key metric that people use to, to measure, uh, to, to quantify entanglement is called the entanglement entropy, uh, which is denoted S sub A for reasons that will soon become clear. Um, the, the, this, uh, this particular entanglement measure is attributed to von Neumann. And you know, sort of very cartoonishly, uh, I'm not saying I don't want you to take me literally here, but you know, cartoonishly, the classical simulation complexity should scale like the exponential of you know something of order the entanglement entropy, because basically uh, the entanglement entropy is telling you how much entanglement is in your system, and it's precisely that entanglement that is you know contributing to the non-classicality of your of of your problem. Okay, so what is the entanglement entropy? So given a pure state rho on n qubits that uh, you can sort of partition into two subsystems, A and B, that I've kind of depicted here, um, you can define the reduced density matrix, which is you know, denoted rho sub A. And uh, you know, that's basically just the trace over degrees of freedom in B of this pure state uh, density matrix. Uh, and then the entanglement entropy is just the like Shannon entropy associated with that uh, that reduced density matrix. Okay, so even though the, the you know the whole system is in a is in a pure state, uh, the reduced density matrix is is mixed uh, generically, and um, and and that's why there's a, there can be a, some non-zero entropy uh, associated with that with that uh, density matrix, and you know typically we sort of classify quantum states uh, in, into sort of two, broadly into two categories. Um, depending on the scaling of the entanglement entropy with uh, the volume of the subregion A, okay? So in, in a d-dimensional system, the volume of the subregion A goes like L to the D, right? And we say that uh, quantum anybody state is a volume loss state if, the, if its entanglement entropy scales like uh, L to the D, okay? So that means that it scales like uh, the Hilbert space dimension, like the full Hilbert space dimension of subregion A, okay? It's so like if you exponentiate SA in a volume law system, you get back the Hilbert space dimension. And then that just tells you that if I really want that, you know, that I can't really get, I can't really get, I, I, I can't really sort of uh, play any funny tricks to like uh, reduce entanglement or so on. Like I really need that whole Hilbert space of subregion A 
uh, to simulate what's going on inside subregion A. Okay, so I can't play any tricks and throw away degrees of freedom like we do in like the MRG or other classical algorithms. Um, you know, I'm kind of stuck with that exponential Hilbert space, right? And then um, this sort of entanglement is, is sort of relatively reduced in what are called area law states. So, so these are states in which the entanglement entropy scales like L to the D minus one. So it scales like the volume of the boundary between subregions A and B rather than the volume of subregion A itself, okay? So what kind of states have volume law versus area law entanglement? Well, generic quantum states, like a random state in the Hilbert space has volume law entanglement, okay? As you might expect. And in fact, uh, you know, Page has a really nice result from the early 90s uh, that proves essentially that a random state on n qubits uh, divided into, you know, n a plus n b is equal to uh, n a log two minus uh, some some prefactor, which is, you know, of order one when the when a and b are of similar size. Uh, so basically, that tells you that, you know, because s a scales like n a, that means that, you know, this random state has volume law entanglement. And so that, that means that, you know, if I'm given a Hilbert space, like most states, like the overwhelming majority of states in that Hilbert space are volume law rather than area law, okay? Um, however, uh, ground states of gapped local Hamiltonians are believed to have area law entanglement, okay? So area law states are kind of special because they, they have a reduced amount of entanglement and you can think of them as kind of a very, very special and small subset of the full possible space of quantum states, right? Um, and in fact, there's a proof in, uh, of this fact or, or of the statement in, in one dimension, okay? So, and, and note that in one dimension, this is special. So um, in, in D equals one area law implies that the entanglement entropy is constant because the entanglement entropy goes like L to the D minus one. So that means that uh, gapped ground states, especially in one uh, dimension, are much easier to simulate classically than generic quantum states. Uh, and in fact, you know, for one dimensional systems, uh, this is, you know, DMRG, for example, density matrix for normalization group is uh, one of the most successful um, classical uh, computational algorithms, um, you know, to the point where, you know, in, in one D, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, for finding ground states, you can't really do any better. Um, yeah, so, okay, so the ground states basically are, are relatively, Rel relatively speaking, especially in one dimension, which is like where a lot of our test beds for quantum antibody systems in the near term are, you know, those are those are actually relatively easy to simulate classically. So, you know, the question is, okay, well, what about like other states in the Hilbert space? Um, and uh, so this is where these kind of highly excited states come in. So what is a highly excited state? Um, basically a highly excited state given some uh, many body Hamiltonian, um, is, uh, you know, H, uh, H times E equals E times E, right? So given some eigenstate with energy E of this many body Hamiltonian, I'm, I'm gonna call a state highly excited if it has finite energy density, okay? So what that means is that the energy per qubit in my system is finite. Um, and, you know, you can sort of visualize uh, these highly excited states uh, along the energy axis like so. So like if my ground state is living here and then there's some gap, right? I have some low lying excited states, which, you know, are still, um, they contain say like a few excitations above the ground state, but then eventually I reach this kind of continuum of states higher up in energy. And it's precisely in that continuum of states where these uh, highly excited states live. And uh, for sufficiently generic uh, many body Hamiltonians, if you take the entanglement entropy and plot it as a function of energy, um, you typically get a curve that looks like this, okay? Um, so if I take every eigenstate and plot the entanglement entropy, you get this curve. Um, and uh, you know the important thing to note is that if you look at how this curve scales with system size, like as you increase the number of qubits, you find that states kind of in the tails of this curve have area law entanglement while states in the middle have volume law entanglement. And it's precisely the highly excited states that are believed to have uh, volume law entanglement entropy. And if you study thermodynamics, this actually looks a lot like the, uh, you know, this actually looks a lot like the entropy versus energy curve uh, that you see in, in, in thermodynamics, right? And in particular, the sort of, um, you know, inverse temperature is defined as the derivative of this curve with respect to energy. So infinite temperature is like roughly here in the middle of the spectrum where, the, where this curve flattens out, right? And actually that's, that's um, there's uh, 
there's a, a notion called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that says that we should actually take this that kind of resemblance seriously, okay, in the, in the following sense. So given an eigenstate with energy E, um, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis says that uh, the reduced density matrix associated with that highly excited state should look in some sense uh, a lot like the uh, thermal density matrix, the, the sort of Gibbs or Boltzmann uh, density matrix of that same many body Hamiltonian at a temperature that's set by the energy density of the, of the eigenstate. So what that means is that uh, for uh, states in the middle of the many body spectrum, if you consider two states with E and E prime that are, you know, energies E and E prime that are sufficiently close together, uh, you know, the expectation values of local observables supported within say subregion A should look very similar, okay? And in fact, they should approach, uh, you know, as we make the number of qubits larger and larger, they should approach something close to the, the sort of canonical thermal expectation value uh, of that observable in, uh, you know, in an ensemble of the temperature fixed by that energy density, okay? So the idea of ETH is that finite energy density eigenstates actually locally encode finite temperature properties, okay? And there's actually substantial numerical evidence for ETH in, in quote unquote generic interacting quantum systems. So like 1D, 2D, basically like, you know, most, you know, most systems, unless something funny is going on, uh, seem to obey ETH. Um, you know, so that's basically telling us something about statistical, like StatMech type properties, but there's another, you know, venue in which highly excited states are important and that's quantum dynamics. So, you know, in quantum dynamics, uh, you know, we, we're interested in studying problems like quantum quenches, where you prepare some simple initial state, for example, a product state, then you kind of turn the crank and do some unitary evolution. And then after some time, you measure the expectation value of a local observable. Um, for example, like a local magnetization, uh, or, you know, a sum of local observables, like the magnetization density, something like this. Um, and of course, you know, if you write down the, uh, you know, time evolved form of the operator O in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian H, you see that basically we have overlaps with, with the initial state that enter and we have expectation values that enter, right? So for generic Hamiltonians, the initial state overlaps with exponentially many eigenstates, right? So, so basically, you know, your initial state, if it's a product state, is actually going to have overlap with exponentially many eigenstates, uh, you know, sort of throughout the many body spectrum, okay? So that means that you need to consider all of those states. And in fact, you know, if you, you know, want to calculate this quantity, you also need to know what the, what the sort of matrix elements of this operator in these eigenstates look like. So you need to have some sense of the statistics of operator expectation values uh, in highly excited states in order to understand uh, relaxation dynamics after a quantum quench. So kind of the summary so far, before I get to you know, the actual work that we did, is that you know, ground states of low dimensional quantum systems are attractive targets for variational quantum algorithms, but they're easier to simulate classically than generic quantum states. Um, Meanwhile, if we think about highly excited states, they are much more challenging to simulate classically due to, due to their volume law entanglement. And they're actually of interest, they're interesting because uh, they're relevant to finite temperature and dynamical properties. So in this talk, basically the question that I'm gonna ask is, you know, can variational quantum algorithms be used to study highly excited states? So, you know, what, and what would such an algorithm look like, right? So, um, Okay, so the first question you wanna ask if you wanna do like a variational simulation of highly excited states is which cost function should I use? Okay, so VQE uh, minimizes the energy expectation value or minimizes the expectation value of the Hamiltonian because it targets the ground state, right? So we want a cost function that can recognize arbitrary eigenstates now, not just the ground state. So what cost function should we use? Um, and there are various choices, um, but I'm gonna consider two today. Um, one is the energy variance, okay? So rather than just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, we can compute the variance of the Hamiltonian in the variational state psi, okay? And uh, use that as our cost function. Now, so the thing that's nice about this cost function is, you know, yes, it's positive semi-definite, but it also vanishes if and only if uh, psi of theta is an eigenstate of H. So if, if we find a state with zero energy variance, we know that it's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, 
but we don't know what uh, energy it has, okay? And I should say that uh, VQEs uh, involving energy variants uh, have actually been applied uh, in the recent past to uh, look at low-lying excitations above the ground state, but nobody has used this kind of cost function to try to study highly excited states. The other um, type of cost function comes from something that's called the folded spectrum method, which actually was, was proposed in, in you know, one of the early papers on VQE. Um, and this is also used in classical approaches to trying to simulate uh, highly excited states. And the idea is, you know, instead of uh, measuring the uh, expectation value of the Hamiltonian, let's measure the expectation value of, you know, Hamiltonian minus lambda squared, okay? So this is, you know, this is not a physical Hamiltonian, this is some non-local Hamiltonian, but, you know, if you take this thing and, you know, rewrite it uh, and, uh, you know, play some tricks, you can see that the, this cost function is actually equal to the variance. So it's equal to the variance plus a positive quantity uh, that measures how far away the expectation value in the variational state is from lambda. Okay, so this is basically, it's like the variance, but it specifically targets eigenstates with energy lambda, and we take lambda to be a free parameter. Okay, so, um, and, and like I said, there are other, um, other cost functions that you can imagine using, um, but these ones are kind of uh, nice for uh, reasons that I'll get into on the next slide. Um, and as, as you see, you know, we can either say, I don't really care what energy I end up with at the end of the day, as long as I end up in an eigenstate, and then, you know, the energy variance is a good option for you. Or if you say, I would really like to end up in an eigenstate with energy close to lambda, then you can use the folded spectrum method as well. And the question is, you know, uh, do these perform differently? Um, is fixing a lambda, having a lambda in mind that I want to converge to initially, does that like hurt my optimization at all? So we thought that these were sort of two good cost functions to compare to one another. Um, now, so, I, so one reason that these uh, cost functions are kind of nice is that, um, you know, that is, is, it has to do with, the, with how hard it is to measure uh, the cost function, right? So variational quantum algorithms, because you're optimizing uh, iteratively, have, uh, they require many measurements uh, of the cost function. So you'd better choose something that's relatively easy to measure, right? So um, you can ask, like one way of quantifying the complexity of uh, measuring one of these cost functions is, you know, suppose that we've chosen a fixed ansatz, how many two qubit gates do we need to measure uh, the cost function, okay? So like two qubit gates are a nice measure of complexity because uh, they, the two qubit gates kind of dominate the, the, error, uh, the error rates on NISC devices. So it is the two qubit error rate that limits uh, the performance of those devices. So how many C naughts do we need? So suppose that we have a Hamiltonian that is a sum of uh, you know, order N uh, Pauli strings, AI. Okay, so AI are Pauli strings. And I'm taking a sum of like, you know, some, something of order N uh, Pauli strings. So uh, to measure a Pauli string of constant length L in the computational basis, uh, you require order L uh, C naughts, okay? And I'm saying that order L is actually order one for, our, for the purposes of you know, this kind of uh, resource estimate, because I'm assuming that I have a local Hamiltonian, so my Pauli strings have a bounded length, right? Um, so basically this L is just gonna be something that could come out as a prefactor, but it won't affect the scaling of uh, measuring, say, cumulants of the energy distribution. Um, so, you know, of course, H squared, if H has uh, N Pauli strings in it, then uh, H squared has N squared Pauli strings. Um, uh, so, oh, sorry, I should say, so I'm skipping a step here. So VQE, for, you know, for VQE, you want to measure the expectation value of the energy in, in one of these states, uh, in, you know, in, in your onsat state. So I need order N C naughts to do the measurement because to do, to do each, to measure each Pauli string, I need order one uh, C naughts but then that means that I need order n c naughts to measure the total energy, okay? And of course, that's not the total number of two qubit gates that I need to apply in order to run this algorithm. I also have to use the ones that appear in the ansatz, okay? But now, okay, so suppose, to, so to measure the variance, right, which is, you know, say the second cumulant, then I have to, uh, you know, now square, I have to measure the square of h, right? Um, and you know, obviously, as I said, if, a, if, if H has N Pauli strings in it, then H squared has N squared Pauli strings. So that means that for a device with all-to-all -all connectivity, uh, it takes N squared uh, 
you know, of order n squared uh, measurements to measure the variance. But of course, uh, you know, real devices don't necessarily have all to all connectivity. So, um, and that imposes some additional, uh, some additional cost on the number of gates, right? So if, a, if your device has linear connectivity, for example, it actually takes order n cubed rather than order n squared um, uh, C naughts because you know, I have to take the sort of long range C naughts that appear in the naive circuit that I need to measure the uh, energy variance. And then I have to decompose those C naughts again into nearest neighbor C naughts. So that, uh, you know, it, so the scaling is still polynomial, but it increases by a factor of n. So the, but the, the sort of upshot um, I have, here. Of, um, I have one question here. Uh, are we assuming um, the need for this many number of gates at every instant of time? Are one, uh, is that uh, like a snapshot of time? This is the number of gates required to do a single measurement. A single, so, so in order one to, instance. Yeah, a single, yeah, exactly. So like if you want to actually measure the expectation value of H, you have to repeatedly, you have to do, you know, thousands of measurements to get statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so that, that's why like, you know, fewer measurements is better, right? So, um, so yeah. So I was, I was, measurements I, I was thinking of, a, you know, reusability, uh, uh, like uh, going in some kind of an iterative fashion um, uh, and uh, reducing the number of gates, but uh, increasing maybe, um, you know, time instance or something that, that would basically a kind of a interplay between time and resources. Yeah, I mean, I think what, you know, I think what you're saying is essentially the the motivation for these kinds of variational algorithms, uh, because you know the idea is that you know you know I I can do I have to I do have to do many measurements, um, but if my circuit that you know prepares the ansatz is relatively short, then you know I can reuse you know for every measurement I can reuse the full resources of my machine, uh, and you know I just so and I repeatedly so if measurements are cheap to do then you know the variational approach is, is not not too bad um, okay so that's kind of so it's the, that's precisely i think the trade off that that you're trying to uh, implement with a variational algorithm versus some other kind of uh, you know more deterministic algorithm or not determine you know no more sort of fixed algorithm that's non variational essentially like phase estimation or something where you need a longer circuit okay thanks all right very good. So, um, and yeah, please, please, uh, you know, don't hesitate to ask questions. So, um, so the quantum resource cost, you know, for 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 a fixed ansatz, right? So if you if we compare to VQE with the same ansatz, there is a there there is overhead, but it's polynomial overhead. So, um, you know, whereas you know you can imagine other cost functions that are that are you know potentially uh, less 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 forgiving. Okay, so that's so that's the question of which um, which cost function to use. So we like the variance in this folded spectrum cost function. Um, the other question is which ansatz to use. Okay, so variational algorithms are only as good as the ansatz that we choose. Um, so and there's always a question of whether a, you, you know if you make a choice of ansatz, is that fixed ansatz expressive enough to represent the target state? And I'll say more about this towards the end of the talk. But uh, you know so. There's, there's a different strategy, which is an adaptive approach. And, and so there you say, okay, I'm not gonna choose the ansatz because who am I, right? Who am I to dictate what, what, what the right ansatz is? Let's have the computer learn an ansatz for us, okay? So here, what you do is you replace your, um, your, your, your single ansatz by kind of a sequence of ansatz states that are labeled by an index alpha. And alpha kind of labels, uh, you know, the, the, the total number of variational parameters in that state. So what you do is that you optimize step by step. So you go for, from alpha equals one to two and so on. And at each step, you select a new operator O alpha from some predefined pool of operators based on some criterion. Uh, for example, using input from the quantum device. And then you re-optimize your parameters to get like the new, the new state that you're using. And then you check if you've converged and then you proceed and choose a new, new operator, okay? So this kind of adaptive approach has been used uh, you know, successfully in, for example, quantum chemistry problems um, to achieve chemical accuracy with fewer parameters than a fixed ansatz. 
So you can kind of see that here. This is a flow chart for the algorithm. It's not so important to take that all in, but it shows you that there is some kind of, um, there is always a choice. You know, you're always selecting an operator from the pool, then you're sort of select, then you're, you know, you're measuring the gradient, uh, you know, selecting the operator with the largest gradient, and then you grow the onsots. Um, and then you re-optimize. So, so and and using this approach, um, these 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 works uh, showed basically that you know compared to UCCSD, which is a popular uh, fixed odds odds for quantum chemistry problems, the adaptive approach was able to um, produce uh, variational circuits with fewer parameters to achieve um, to achieve chemical accuracy. You know, uh, even with the reduced number of parameters. Okay. So, and actually similar approaches can also be used to perform um, variational uh, real or imaginary time evolution with fewer gates than naive Trotter evolution. So I just wanted to kind of flash these two works from uh, the sort of Ames, uh, Ames uh, quantum computing group on this. Um, so, okay, so, so then that brings us to sort of the title of my talk, which is, you know, adaptive VQEs for highly excited states. And uh, so what we want to do is use this adaptive approach uh, to sort of optimize these cost functions. So um, there, we're gonna sort of consider, as I said, two cost functions. One of them is the variance, okay? And if we're, if we're using the variance as a cost function, I'm gonna call the algorithm adaptive VQE X, where X means four excited states. Um, so this is the sort of variance uh, cost function. And then adaptive folded spectrum method is basically uh, the same thing, same procedure, but different cost function, okay? And as, as, as we said, or as I said earlier, this is, this is related to, uh, to one of the cost functions that I, it's related to the variance, basically. Sorry, Aditya, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, uh, one question. So the adaptive FSM, the lambda, is it a known parameter or do you optimize over lambda also or? We fix it from, from the start. Okay, I see. So we choose it, yeah. And I'll, I'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, okay, so, but regardless of the cost function, we do the same procedure. Uh, to build our onsots and optimize it. So first we choose an initial state, which for us, we're gonna take to be a random product state. Um, for example, we restricted actually in our study to um, initial product states that are real um, for reasons having to do with like the symmetry of the Hamiltonian that we're considering. Um, but you know, for our purposes, we, we just chose like a random product state, not in the Z basis or the X basis, but some superposition. Um, and then, you know, we, as, I, as I said before, it's an adaptive approach. So we define a sequence of ansatz states that are indexed by alpha. And, uh, you know, we're choosing O nu from a pool and I'll, I'll describe uh, which pools we consider in a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, at each step, we uh, choose which operator to add by considering the output of the last step. And then, you know, applying to that, you know, e to the i theta nu O nu for every nu in the pool. And for every new in the pool, we, we uh, compute the cost function and find the minimum. We, you know, we compute the minimum over uh, all, all angles between zero and two pi of the cost function for that operator. And then we choose the operator from the pool that produces the lowest cost function when applied to the previous uh, output, of, output of the previous iteration. And to do that, we use a golden section search, but that's not particularly important. Then after choosing the new operator, we do a parameter update. So the, you know, the output uh, parameters from the alpha step uh, are basically minimizing the uh, onsatz with the new uh, operator uh, included. And we kind of wanted to avoid gradients uh, for, for the present purposes. Although of course you could use like parameter shift rule because our onsatz are the pools that we use are poly string pools. Um, but we use Nelder Mead then to do the optimization because we just wanted to avoid gradients. Um, and then, of course, you have to check for convergence. Once you've, you know, once you've re-optimized your parameters, you have to see, okay, did I converge or not? And the way that we choose uh, that we see whether we've converged or not is we compute this this convergence check f that I'll define below. And basically, f has to be less than some tolerance delta that we set from 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 the outset. I believe we use delta equals ten to the minus four. And okay, so what is this f? It's basically one minus the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the state divided by the square root of the expectation value of H squared, okay? So what this thing measures basically is, it's, it's, like a, it's like a measure of the angle between the state psi and H psi. So basically it vanishes when psi and H psi are collinear. And of course, when those vectors are collinear, that means that we uh, are in an eigenstate, right? 
And it's a nice criterion in this case because it's intensive. So uh, whereas the variance, of course, is, is extensive. Um, okay, so then we iterate until we've converged, uh, you know, so you, until we meet this criterion or until we reach some maximum number of iterations and then we just give up, okay? So, um, and we denote the step at which the algorithm converges by alpha equals NC. So NC is the number of variational parameters in the circuit that does the best job according to this procedure. And NC is kind of like our operational complexity metric for converged trials. Basically how many variational parameters did I need to represent that state? Okay, so, you know, so now, you know, I've defined the algorithm and then now we want to apply it to something. Okay, so what, what model should we use? Um, so we chose what's called the mixed field uh, Ising model. So it's a 1D uh, spin chain that has an Ising interaction and then it has uh, magnetic fields in the X and Z directions. Um, and this is a nice model because um, for generic parameters, it's non-integrable. So that, mean, that means that it's not exactly solvable and therefore it's a sort of parad paradigmatic example of a model that's expected to obey the ETH and have you know, volume lot cited states and excited states that reproduce statistical mechanical properties and things like this. So this is, uh, you Thomas, know. Yeah, Thomas, yes. you had an earlier question that now you've come back to use the term D, 1D. Sure. 1D, 1D means, as I understand it, uh, one dimension in space. Is that? Uh, yes, it means one spatial, one, one, spatial. one spatial dimension. Right. Yes, yeah, so so it means one spatial dimension, and then you know n sub a. Sorry, I, I wasn't. Uh, I didn't see the chat, but now I have it open. So okay. the the um, n sub a is the number of qubits in subregion a. We're actually going to take that to be n over two, where n is the total number of qubits. Um, yeah. So okay. So it's a you know non-integrable uh, sort of paradigmatic uh, ETH obeying system. But if you set h z equal to zero it becomes the transverse field Ising model, which is a classic uh, integrable system. It can be solved using uh, mapping to free fermions. And it's also a very popular benchmark for variational quantum algorithms. So, you know, one question that we wanted to sort of probe in this study is how do adaptive EQEX and folded spectrum method algorithms fare in integrable versus non-integrable regimes? Okay, so is it harder to learn in ansatz for an integrable system or a non-integrable system? Okay, and this model is nice because we can check. Um, so what, you know, some representative parameters for the two regimes, like when we say integrable versus non-integrable. So integrable, of course, we have to set HZ to zero and we set HX to 0.8. Um, uh, you know, so this is some, some, you know, this is some, this is the, the, this is the, the, the representative set of parameters that we chose. And we're measuring all of our parameters and units of J, which is the Ising coupling here. And for the non-integrable case, uh, we set HZ equals uh, 0.5, but we keep HX the same. So that's the first question is like, how do, how do these algorithms fare in integrable versus non-integrable regimes? The other is, um, you know, when we make, uh, when we're doing an iterative or sort of adaptive procedure for, you know, uh, building an ansatz, uh, how does the choice of pool affect the adaptive algorithm's performance? So, um, and I should say, you know, these pools that I'm considering are chosen such that you know they contain operators such that the operator e to the i theta times o is real because the Hamiltonian that I showed on the previous slide has only real matrix elements. So we're not going to be considering, uh, you know, basically like we don't want to we don't want to introduce the extra complication of having the algorithm try to like make uh, you know choices from the pool such that you know the whole conspiracy is such that the final state is real. We would rather just restrict our search to be over a space of real states. Um, so, and then in that space of potential pools, we identify two pools, one that we call the minimal pool. Um, so the minimal pool uh, contains local few body operators. Um, so it basically contains every Pauli Y and then also every uh, Y, I, Z, I plus one for all I in the chain. And we're using periodic boundary conditions. So N plus one is identified with one. So it's the minimal pool. We also consider the maximal pool, which uses you know, both Pauli Ys and then uh, YZ and YXs, where we allow arbitrary separation between uh, the uh, Pauli operators that we apply. So these are still few body operators, but they're not, we are allowing them to be non-local. Okay, so this pool is, is obviously more expensive to implement on a device with only nearest neighbor connectivity. 
But you could also imagine that it on, for example, trapped ion devices where long range gates are easier to do, that you know, this kind of pool might be uh, easier to implement. And uh, I should say, I should note that both pools are complete um, in the sense that you can explore the full Hilbert space using only states drawn from these pools, okay? Uh, and there, you know, the notion of completeness and like how to prove whether a pool is complete was explored in this work. Um, so these pools are, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're flexible enough to allow us to explore the whole Hilbert space if we allow ourselves to draw, you know, arbitrarily many gates from, from the pool. So now we're basically into the results. So, um, so for adaptive VQEX, uh, you know, we, we ran this algorithm, you know, this is, this is adaptive VQEX means that we're using the variance cost function, okay? And so, you know, here, since like, we don't have any say in what the final energy is for our state, um, we chose an ensemble of about a thousand initial random product states. And we're plotting here only the converged trials. So for example, on the X axis of these two plots, you, you have basically a number from like, you know, zero to, you know, maybe 800 or so. And that's kind of plotting only the, the trials that converged, okay? So that tells you that in, you know, in this ensemble of a thousand trials, there were like two, 300 that didn't converge. So um, for the integrable model, this is only, this is for six qubits, okay? So it's a relatively small system. Um, we see basically that uh, we have our sort of, you know, uh, P, we have results for the minimal pool and the maximal pool. Um, and the points here, so these plots, the way that you should read them is that, you know, on the y-axis, we have the energy and units of the Ising coupling. On the x-axis, we have the trial number, okay, for this top panel. And then the points that we plot are colored according to NC, which is the number of variational parameters in the onsatz, okay? And we, um, we cap it at 100 because we made 100 kind of the maximum number of iterations that we would allow. So, and what you see is that, you know, for the, the p-min pool, we achieve better coverage of the full spectrum. And in fact, like if you consider all trials, it looks like we've actually covered more or less uh, every eigenstate to some accuracy. Um, and although, you know, there are noticeable areas in the spectrum where the algorithm was less, less likely to converge, right? Um, so you can see, for example, in this region, there's, there, there are fewer points. Um, but if we use the minimal pool, we are able to cover basically the whole spectrum uh, with, this, with this method. Um, instead, if we use the maximal pool, actually you see that, um, you know, in addition to having lower density of converged trials uh, near zero energy, actually at zero energy, we, there's, there, is a, there is a region here, there are states in the spectrum that we never converge to, right? Um, and, and you can sort of probe that a little bit you know, more by looking, by plotting basically histograms over converged trials of the number of variational parameters in the final state, okay? So you see, you know, for example, in this p-min for the minimal pool, you see that the number of variational parameters is like, uh, you know, between 30 and 40. Uh, and there's a pretty, there's a pretty tight distribution around this uh, green dashed line, which is the average. Whereas, you know, for, for the maximal pool, uh, you know, not only uh, are we not covering the full spectrum, but also we're, we're actually generating longer circuits, okay? So somehow the lesson is that the maximal pool is like offering too much freedom. And I think it's just harder to optimize basically because we have so many choices of operators to add. Um, and you can compare this with the non-integrable case, okay? So for the non-integrable case, we're, you know, plotting everything in the same way. You see that the coverage of the spectrum is much, much sparser uh, with the minimal pool. And there are many states that we never converge to. Whereas if we use the maximal pool, which includes these also non-local operators, you actually do achieve coverage uh, uh, of the spectrum. And if you look at the distribution of output, uh, you know, of the circuits output by, by the algorithm, you see that, you know, there isn't even a, um, a clear, uh, a, you know, that th we have this sort of bimodal distribution. We have a lot of circuits that basically just never converge. Uh, because they had too many variational parameters. We cap, we, again, we capped everything at 100, right? So this is just telling us that like, uh, you know, the distribution of, of circuits never converge because we don't have enough converged trials, right? Whereas, you know, if we allow uh, these non-integrable, if we allow this, these long range gates in the, in, the, in the maximal pool, you see that we do, um, we do get, you know, sort of a distribution that, that's peaked around a well-defined value. Um, so, you know, something that we learned from this 
is you know, that there's this pool dependence in our results. So the maximal pool produces better coverage of the full spectrum in the non-integrable case. And conversely, the minimal pool produces better uh, coverage and more converged trials in the integral case. So that means that you know, this is kind of uh, an example that shows us the typical eigenstates of the non-integrable model require more variational parameters to represent, but also you know, they seem to require uh, longer range gates as well, okay? So it, unless we put those in our pool directly, like with P, in, if we restrict it to the p-min pool, we would have to sort of synthesize those long range gates out of nearest neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor gates. And that's obviously gonna require, uh, that's gonna require more parameters. And so that we can take this as kind of a practical demonstration of the increased complexity of generic eigenstates in non-integrable models versus integrable models, okay? Um, so the other thing that you can ask is, well, you know, what about the eigenstate properties of the states that we converge to, right? So, so this is for the non-integrable case with the maximal pool, which is kind of where we got the best results for the non-integrable case. And I'm plotting basically three observables here. One is just the energy, okay? So. I'm plotting in this case, the energy versus the energy expectation value of the initial product state that we chose to start the trial, okay? So what this plot, what this panel A shows you is that there's kind of a weak correlation between the energy of the initial product state that we put in and the uh, final output energy of, you know, the energy of the final state, basically. So this is telling us that there is some kind of weak correlation between the initial state we choose and the state we end up with, even if we're not controlling like where we're trying to go in the spectrum. Uh, in this middle panel here, what we're plotting is the magnetization density, Mz, which we define as one over L times the sum over I of all Pauli Zs. Um, and the blue points here are from exact diagonalization. So this is just like diagonalizing the system on a classical computer, which again, N equals six is not a big system. This is very easy <laughs> to diagonalize classically. We are not in, uh, we're not anywhere close to a regime where, you know, quantum advantage is possible, okay? Um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then the red points here are the VQEX trials. And you see that um, actually, you know, in the middle of the spectrum, the algorithm is, is quite good at reproducing, uh, is quite good at reproducing the average magnetization density of the states that, that, we, that, we, that we construct, okay, the, of, the, of the actual states, the actual eigenstates. And then finally here, we're looking at the entanglement entropy. Okay, so the, which I defined, you know, a few slides ago. And here you see uh, that, you know, the results are a little bit less uh, nicely lying on top of the, of the data points, but actually like, the, you know, these, these solid lines uh, that we put here, these are basically averages over energy bins. Okay, so what we did here is we made a set of points for uh, the VQEX and ED trials where uh, we basically just averaged the entanglement entropy over an energy bin with a fixed width. And then these lines connect those sort of bin averaged points. And what you see basically is that the, the sort of general trend in the middle of the spectrum is that you know, the, the states that we're producing you know, are kind of reproducing the average entanglements within an energy window, okay? So in that sense, you know, the states that we're, that we're getting out are not so bad. Um, you know, but, you know, something that you can already see from these plots is that the algorithm often converges to superpositions of nearby eigenstates. So that's, you know, for example, here we see that we have like a bunch of trials that converge to like a continuum of possible magnetizations. So you can think of that continuum as being kind of indexed by some superposition parameter, okay? And of course, you can actually check and see that the states in here are actually superpositions of two very close, two very nearby eigenstates. And you also see that here, where, where you have this sort of continuum of entanglement entropies. Uh, in fact, the entanglement entropy, you know, is much more sensitive uh, because it's not it's the nonlinear, it's nonlinear in the in the density matrix. So it's it's more sensitive to different superposition quantities. Um, so you can say, okay, well, why am I converging to superpositions? I thought that you know we could only converge if if this thing was uh, and was an eigenstate. Um, that's not strictly true. Okay, so. For example, our convergence criterion is this kind of uh, angle between psi and h psi, and we say that we converge if this angle is less than delta. And uh, you can check explicitly by putting in a state that is a superposition of an eigenstate with energy E and an eigenstate with energy E plus delta, that you know, if you work to leading order in the, in the energy difference delta, uh, the cost function depends on you know, superposition parameters uh, times delta squared. Okay, and actually, you know, delta 
in the middle of the spectrum, like the nearest neighbor uh, eigenstate energy spacing in the middle of the spectrum is actually exponentially small. Okay, so that means that you know for some superposition parameters, uh, if we have two states that are very close together, it's possible to actually satisfy this this convergence criterion. Okay, unless perhaps we make the the convergence criterion exponentially small, but that's probably not a good thing for us to do. So uh, nevertheless, you know, even though we're converging to superpositions, uh, you know, the variational states are able to reproduce properties of eigenstates uh, within an energy window, and that may be useful, okay, as I'll discuss later. Um, so, so that was VQEX, that was using the variance as a cost function. But now you could say, okay, well, let's, what, you know, what if we actually wanted to target a certain energy, okay? Uh, uh, so so that, that, for that, we need to use the folded spectrum method. So what we do here is we start from a fixed randomly chosen product state, okay? Um, and then we sweep the target energy lambda from the, from, you know, over the whole bandwidth of, of, uh, of energies, okay? So we sweep lambda in discrete steps over the whole spectrum. And then for each lambda value, we optimize. And um, I'm only showing results here uh, for integrable, the integral case with the minimal pool and the non-integral case with the maximal pool. Um, but we're observing the same pool dependence that we observed in VQEX. Um, but you see that actually like uh, we achieve pretty, pretty good coverage of the spectrum. There is a missing spot uh, here in the integrable case, but we cover the whole spectrum in the non-integrable case. Um, and in fact, if you look at the histogram of uh, the converged number of variational parameters over, uh, uh, over you know, all of the converged instances of our, uh, of our algorithm, we uh, find converged circuit length on average is nearly identical to VQEX. So we're actually, um, you know, it, basically it looks like you know, selecting a target energy is not actually um, hindering us too much in our, in our, uh, in our search for eigenstates. Okay. Um, and then this brings me to kind of the, you know, the central challenge, uh, and I'm, I'm actually getting towards the end of the talk. So I think I will finish on time. Uh, so, so of course the challenge here, right, is that we were showing results for n equals six, which is not a very big Hilbert space. And, uh, you know, a natural question is how does the number of variational parameters needed to represent the state scale with system size, okay? So, if you take our uh, algorithm and you run it at you know n equals seven, n equals eight, um, you know, and then plot the the average over all uh, converged trials of the number of variational parameters, what you see is that there's a roughly exponential dependence uh, on n, right? So that means that it looks like exponent. We need exponentially many variational parameters to represent these states. Okay, and so and actually classical optimization over that many parameters is the bottleneck. So that is the thing that, we, that, that is preventing our algorithm from scaling up. So the, the lesson is that, you know, yes, these, uh, the, you know, we can represent these states, but you need a lot of parameters and the, and the optimization over that many parameters is uh, becoming prohibitive, right? And in fact here, so this is an example uh, for n equals eight, right? Where we did get a data point for the integrable case, but for the non-integrable case, we didn't. And you see what happens, right? So on the left, we have the integrable model with the minimal pool, and you see that actually we, you know, we did not such a bad job of, of covering the whole spectrum here. But in the non-integrable case, we uh, really we really can't converge to states in the middle of the spectrum. Um, uh, and you know we're allowing for like 125 uh, variational parameters. So basically, like the you know the 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 trials that are using that many parameters, uh, just you know they 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 aren't converging fast enough. So the sort of lesson, and then I'll kind of wrap up with a little bit of an outlook, is that, you know, yes, we can de design variational quantum algorithms to approximate highly excited states using an adaptive strategy. Um, the algorithm performance is sensitive to non-integrability or integrability of the simulated model, which is kind of interesting. That means that, you know, this ansatz that we're learning is also learning that integrable models are more complicated, or, you know, that non-integrable models are more complicated than integrable models. Right. Um, and, you know, we also learned that the variational states for converged trials, you know, do provide good approximations to average eigenstate properties within an energy window. And we learned that the number of variational parameters appears to scale exponentially with the system size. Okay. So in my last couple minutes, um, 
I wanted to just present an outlook on how do we make progress with this information now, right? So one way that we can potentially make progress is, you know, we were using an adaptive strategy, but what about, you know, what about a fixed onsatz? Would, you know, that would, that would potentially, you know, uh, you know, could, could we find a, a fixed onsatz that's expressive enough to uh, allow us to solve this optimization problem with fewer parameters, okay? So one possible example or one example that's kind of promising is known as the Hamiltonian variational onsatz. So this is an onsatz where, you know, given a Hamiltonian that splits up into a sum of say two commuting parts, H1 and H2, uh, sorry, so uh, two, H1 and H2 don't commute with each other, but every term in H1 commutes with every other term in H1, for example. So H1 and H2 are sums of mutually commuting terms. You can define an onsatz with a sort of index P where you know, at each layer uh, K, you have an angle for H1 and an angle for H2. And then the total number of variational parameters is 2P, right? And uh, in this uh, paper by Viersma, it was shown that uh, HVA states with uh, P equals N can realize volume loss states. Um, and that's what's being shown here. So in particular, random HVA states resemble har random states on average for sufficiently large P. Um, so here they're plotting the, uh, what's called the entanglement spectrum, which is uh, the eigenvalues essentially of the reduced density matrix. And there's some expected distribution for a random uh, matrix that we appear to converge to, or that they appear to converge to as P approaches N. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, you know, a last direction is, you know, what about, what if, you know, maybe, maybe approximating individual eigenstates is, is too, uh, maybe, maybe that's too demanding. Maybe we're asking too much from this algorithm to have it try to represent a single eigenstate. And maybe what we want, or maybe something that would work instead is to use these variational states as microcanonical estimators. So we've already shown that variational states can reproduce averages of eigenstate properties over an energy window, right? So what if we optimized our onsatz state until we hit, say, an energy standard deviation uh, sigma that we set as like our tolerance, okay? And then if you uh, sort of imagine looking at the smoothed out uh, distribution of uh, energy in that state, you know, it's like a Gaussian with, with, with sigma, okay? And then the question is, uh, you know, uh, how well does the expectation value of O in that variational state approximate the microcanonical average of O over the energy window of width two sigma uh, around uh, centered on energy E, e zero, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is if we fix some tolerance for sigma, say sigma of order one over N, uh, are fewer variational parameters ultimately required? Uh, and can we still get out uh, sort of the sort of things that we're interested in, these kind of statistical properties of eigenstates within an energy window. And I should say there is uh, an alternative non-variational strategy that's already been proposed, uh, that was proposed last year. Um, so, you know, there, there are algorithms, uh, quantum algorithms out there that can do this, um, but the variational path hasn't really been, hasn't really been checked yet. And that might be good, uh, a good candidate for doing something uh, useful on a NISC device. So. Uh, with that, uh, I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, thank you. That was that was truly a, a very fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to, uh, we should open things to uh, questions. Actually, if, if I can start, uh, there was one that was given by Soham uh, that I think is particularly uh, 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 topical, that is, what can we say about the quantum advantage when using these more resource involved cost fu functions, particularly in the presence of noise? Right. So yeah, the presence of noise is not something that we considered here. We were more interested in just kind of the question of principle, like, uh, you know, how easy is it to obtain, uh, you know, using variational strategies, uh, estimates for uh, highly excited states. Um, However, you're, you know, you're completely right that, you know, if you want to sort of claim that quantum advantage is possible, you do need to consider, uh, you know, the resource cost of uh, doing these kinds of measurements and, you know, what, what the sort of corresponding best classical algorithm could do, right? So I, you know, I can't really say anything about that. Um, uh, that's like, you know, I can't really say anything very solid about that because we haven't really thought about running this, device, this algorithm on a real device. 
However, um, it is clear that like for a small number of qubits, like uh, n versus n squared versus n cubed, like that, you know, n cubed might be prohibitively difficult. Where, whereas you know n, uh, you know n is maybe easier, right? So it, the that sort of polynomial overhead could be the difference between being able to run this thing on a real device and not being able to. Uh, and then of course you're right, you know, how does noise affect all of these things? Is an interesting question. I will say that um, VQE for ground state problems uh, has uh, has you know been found to be relatively robust to noise on real devices. Um, so that kind of gives us some hope that potentially, you know, because we're using essentially the same principles here uh, to calculate uh, higher excited states. Although, of course, it would be interesting to see, uh, you know, how much more sensitive is, uh, for example, are these cumulants of the energy distribution to noise rather than just the first cumulant, right? Um, so these are all interesting questions, um, uh, but I don't really have a concrete answer for you at this point. I guess, Jonathan, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, could it even be that noise would be an advantage? Um, one of those cases you showed, you actually missed one of the energy eigenstates. And um, right. would having noise in there have got you that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, so like here, for example, we have this hole in, the, in, our, in, our, in our spectrum, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, that could be, I mean, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the effect of noise in the context of, um, for example, like this strategy um, where we're only looking to converge to a superposition, right? So I think the less demanding you are regarding your convergence criterion, the probably the, the, the more noise resilient you're going to be. Um, and, you know, if, if, if we're working in a system where, you know, we, we actually can, uh, you know, uh, optimize the, the parameters, uh, you know, even with the noise. Um, it is possible that, you know, maybe, maybe asking that we converge just to like some distribution of energy that's not too wide is actually, you know, maybe that is more resilient to noise than asking that we converge to one state, right? Like that's the, that's kind of the hard, um, that's, that, that's the thing that I think is making this problem uh, very hard to solve, uh, you know, using our initial, um, using our initial strategy, right? Because there, what we wanted to do was we wanted to try to converge to individual eigenstates just to see how hard it is. And, you know, it turns out to be hard, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that prop, that, that, you know, so, so yeah, there, there, that's, a, that's an interesting question, but, you know, noise maybe is, is, is helpful, especially in scenarios where you're not trying to hit one uh, eigenstate on the head. You're, you know, trying to just converge to some distribution. Mm -hmm. So, and James, yeah, you had a question? Yeah, uh, very, very nice uh, talk uh, and nice results, Thomas. Um, so in nuclear physics, um, on the one hand, there, there is interest in um, averages over highly excited states because that's really what the experiments tend to uh, measure in the end. You know, you have a strength function that's uh, got some experimental resolution involved. So that's, a, that's on the mm -hmm. one hand. On the other hand, there's also a lot of interest in the um, excitation spectrum above the ground state, but maybe not mm -hmm. so high as to get into this statistical region. And uh, I'm trying to imagine from your results, um, whether the VQEX or the folded spectrum method would be the preferred method for say, going steadily upwards from the ground state, let's say, you want to go up sure. to 10, 10, some, something like 10 excited states where there's still a discrete, right. still a discrete spectrum, not, sure. not so dense. Right. So, and you can see that a little bit here. So, uh, you know, you can see that to represent the ground state with the folded spectrum method requires far fewer gates, for example, than representing states in the middle of the spectrum. And then there's some kind of like continuum in the number of parameters that you require. Um, and it kind of appears to sort of increase on average uh, as you go higher in the spectrum. So it may indeed with the folded spectrum method be easier to uh, represent low-lying excited states. And I do know that there have been some results um, that, uh, that do this for, for low-lying excited states. Of course, um, you know, you can also um, uh, play more sophisticated tricks if you know 
what the low lying excitations look like. Right. Mm -hmm. So of course, like if your lowest lying state is like the vacuum and then your the, the next state above that is like one particle on top of the vacuum, right? I can search, I can make an onsatz that is basically gonna be in a space spanned by, you know, like uh, excitations on different sites, right? And people have done this uh, to, you know, for, for example, uh, quantum chemistry type problems. Um, so in those cases, you, you may even be able to just do VQE within, like, you know, if you want just like the ground state, right, the sort of band minimum of the like one particle excited state, or even the band minimum of in the sort of two excitation, uh, in the two excitation region, you can just do VQE um, with an onsatz that is only probing those multi excitation states and probably for a few, for, for a few excitations on top of the ground state that is sufficient. Um, I would imagine. And there are results to that effect in the literature. Mm -hmm. hey, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. I believe we have a question from uh, Rana Biswas. Do you want to go ahead? Hi, Tom. Yeah, very nice talk. Hi, Rana. Uh, uh, yeah, going back to that earlier example of the beryllium hydride. So uh, these small molecules that uh, people have studied suffer from the same problem, right? The uh, number of variational functions scales exponentially with system size. Is that correct? And, um, so not as, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the quantum chemistry literature, but I do know, for example, that like when you take the quantum chemistry uh, model, right, uh, defined for this molecule, and then you map it onto qubits, you, you get some Hamiltonian that is very non-local, right? Yeah. Um, so I suspect that, you know, the ground state of a Hamiltonian, if that Hamiltonian is non-local, uh, is going to be much harder to simulate than the ground state of a local Hamiltonian. Um, so, and, and, you know, it's possible that the, that the, uh, you know, even if the, the sort of, um, ground state of this molecule is kind of, uh, you know, area law in like some orbital picture, right? Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be area law in the sort of real space picture of the, of the, of the geometry of the qubit device, right? So um, it would not surprise me if, uh, if um, quantum chemistry models do suffer from actually exponential uh, parameter scaling, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not the person to ask about that. There are others in, this, uh, in the audience, I think, who could answer the question better than me. And that's why it helps to have uh, more simple molecules with just S and P orbitals. Uh, so you reduce the number of variational functions for those, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. I think we also have a question from Peter Love. Uh, okay. Hi, Tom. Hi, Peter. Uh, that was a really nice talk, thank you. Uh, Thanks. I guess I just have a comment, which, you know, you gave such a nice presentation of the um, the sort of entropy picture of ground states and the characterization of them. It struck me that that's, there's such a strong conflict between the picture that you get from thinking about entropy and the picture that you get from what's called Hamiltonian complexity where you think about the computational complexity of solving various ground state problems. Yeah, uh, I think like, yeah, right. That's, that's definitely true. I mean, it, yeah, like, I gener mean, generically in computer science, in the computer science complexity picture, you think of ground states as being what's called QMA hard. Absolutely, right. And, and dynamics you think is naturally sort of BQP complete. And in this very mm -hmm. nice picture you gave, the physical, our physical intuition about these states is exactly reversed. But yeah. this is not a criticism at all of what you said, it just shows you know, how much harder it is to prove theorems in computer science. Yeah, and I mean, you know, a great example is like boson sampling, right? Because like the dynamics of, of bosons, uh, on non-interacting bosons on a lattice is not very right. hard from my perspective to simulate, right? But we also know that that's like one of the ways that people propose to use to prove quantum advantage. Because actually like in some computer science sense, it's very hard to sample from that distribution, from the output distribution of that. So, so I agree, it is very counterintuitive to me that boson sampling is like a good way to to demonstrate quantum advantage, but indeed that is, I think, an example of what you're discussing. <laughs> so one, yeah. one, con one more uh, specific comment is, you know, you use the transverse Ising model as your example here. Uh, 
of course, there's another thing one can say about the transverse Ising model, which is that it's stochastic, meaning mm -hmm. that the, the, the wave function in the ground state has all the same phase. Um, right. However, just to plug one of my own papers, uh, Stephen Jordan and David Gossett and I wrote a paper showing actually that even in this computer science formal picture, the excited states of such stochastic models can still be hard. So that I sort see. of goes in the direction of what you're saying, that excited states That's, can be harder than ground states. Okay. That, that is very interesting because, yeah, like, uh, you know, in that case, like, I mean, I wouldn't say that we do, like, uh, amazingly better in the uh, integral case uh, at finding excited states, but there is, I mean, there, I mean, given the fact that we're only restricting ourselves to like uh, local, local uh, operators in the pool, for example, uh, I think that the difference in, in complexity, like, I think maybe the folded spectrum is the simplest place to see this, but, you know, uh, I mean, you can just see here that you know yeah you can it's it's much easier to cover to cover the whole spectrum here but you know so that that would be an interesting that is maybe an interesting perspective uh -huh. uh, on the fact that you know maybe we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't be too quick to discount excited states of integrable systems from the point uh -huh. of view of quantum advantage um yeah great thank you thanks hey right, tom can i ask a question sure yeah, so uh, can you go back to that slide where you were talking about this minimal pool and maximal pool that you were- uh, Sure. Saying? I have to remember, I believe it was here, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so why is there no X parameter ever here that you use? Uh, right, so right. So the idea, I mean, so we do have, we have X's here, but I mean, so the idea is that we want to construct, uh, we want to choose operators from our pool such that the exponential of I times some number times that operator is real. And this is not true for X. It is true for any Pali string containing an odd number of Y's because Y is imaginary. Um, so, and Y is the only imaginary Pali matrix. So for one body uh, uh, Pali strings, uh, Y is the only one that we can choose. Um, but in, in general, anything with an odd number of Ys will be odd under complex conjugation. And therefore the, the gate that we apply will be even under complex conjugation. I see, okay, good. And also one more thing, uh, uh, so, do you think you would gain in some of your results if you actually did gradient search rather than Eldermead? I mean, that is a really good question. We did not uh, investigate at all um, the potential utility of uh, gradient based versus gradient free. I mean, I know that Eldermead, uh, you know, from from the perspective of um, optimization, right? Like gradient descent is supposed to be much more efficient than Eldermead. Um, you know. The, the reason that we use Elder Mead is that we just wanted to avoid the um, challenge of measuring gradients on the quantum computer. Um, right. However, for, for, for gates like the, you know, for gates drawn from the pools that we're considering, uh, you know, because these Pauli strings uh, square to the identity, you actually can compute gradients relatively easily uh, on, a, on a quantum device using this. You, you only need to measure the cost function at two points, as you know. Right. Um, so, so, you know, so this parameter shift rule is certainly an option and that does open up, uh, you know, gradients, uh, as a potential, um, tool for you. Um, and we're not sure if that, uh, really kind of, um, you know, would, would we sort of be able to go farther, uh, you know, using a different optimization routine is an interesting question, um, that we didn't really explore, but, you know, certainly, I mean, I suspect, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like how well you can do is ultimately, I think, limited by the exponential scaling, right? So um, it's not going to, I think, get rid of the exponential scaling, um, even though like there is some, there is, there is like some entwinement of like your choice of optimization routine and your number of variational parameters at the end of the day. I actually think that this exponential scaling of the number of variational parameters for these type of volume loss states should be actually, um, like uh, should that I think that's physics. Um, so I think that I think that that has to be kind of the case. But of course, you know, it's possible that if we used better or more efficient optimization techniques, we could add another one or two qubits, right? Um, so thank you.
All right. Uh, many great questions. Uh, certainly, I'd like to leave things open if there are any more. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'd like to close the, the seminar by thanking Tom again for the great talk and thanking everyone for joining us uh, this uh, wonderful morning. Uh, like usual, we'll be uploading this talk to the QCGSS uh, YouTube, YouTube channel, and we'll be holding the next QCGSS talk uh, on June 18th, uh, for which more info will be provided via email uh, in the next in the coming weeks. Um, thank you again, everyone. Excellent, uh, wonderful time, uh, and uh, have a wonderful morning. <laughs>